give Allison another hearty amen. Amen. Thank you for ministering to us this morning. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Sabbath. It's the end of the year. Praise God. They don't like for us to use the word crazy, so I, I won't say that it's been a crazy year. But but it's been a good one too, hasn't it? Amen. I think, I, think um, I just praise God because I know that I've been blessed. Uh, you're here. You've been blessed. Uh, just praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I thank Him. I give Him all the praise. I give Him all the glory. We had uh, two deaths in our family this year. One year. That hasn't happened. I don't remember when that happened. Uh, so it hasn't been a very good year. But I, I praise the Lord. I'm in church this morning. At the end of the year. And by His grace I'll be here next year. Amen. As for Father in heaven, eternal God, I do thank you. I do praise you. What a loving and wonderful Savior you are. Please God. Be with us today. Come by here, Lord. Pour out your spirit upon us. Help us, Father, to be everything that you want us to be this morning, this Saturday. Because I ask it in Jesus' name. Let everybody say it. Amen. As, as this most blessed season of the year slowly comes to an end, and we look forward to the new year, the leadership of our church and the North American Division, you saw it in your bulletin there, North American Division focus is on evangelism. So the leadership of this church, our North American Division and our world church is squarely focused on evangelism. So today, this last Sabbath, of the year, this 13th Sabbath, as most of the world prepares to make what has become a tradition for many of us, a New Year's resolution, I'm impressed to speak on an evangelistic effort that is recorded in the Bible and took place during this blessed time of year. My hope is that perhaps many of us would rethink those resolutions that we plan to make and resolve that in 2013, each of us will partner with the Holy Spirit with a rebirth of energy, power, and zeal in our efforts to lead men, women, boys, and girls to Christ. And endeavor by God's grace to assist in preparing them for the kingdom of God. Somebody say Amen. Amen. The title of this sermon is Have You Seen His Star? Have You Seen His Star? Do you know that the Holy Spirit has always been involved in evangelism? Sure you know that. But one of his most memorable efforts took place after that first Christmas after the birth of Jesus. Go with me in your Bibles to our text today. Matthew 2, verse 1 and 2. Matthew 2, verses 1 and 2. And I'm sure it's on the screen because of our technology. I'm reading from the New King James Version. Now, after Jesus was born, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. In the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born of the Jews, born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. On that glorious night in Bethlehem. You've heard the story. 
angels were seen overhead singing and praising God for the great sacrifice that he had made for all of us. Their presence lit up the sky and could be seen for many miles. At the same time, somewhere in the eastern part of the then known world, amid the darkness of heathenism, there were philosophers, influential men of noble birth, according to Ellen White in her book, Desire of Ages, page 59, who studied the sky. These magicians, as they were called, had seen a mysterious light on the night of our Savior's birth. They began to study this strange phenomenon. They researched the history books. They studied the scriptures. They found where Balaam, you, you remember Balaam? Yeah. At one time, according to Ellen White, he was a member of this noble group of philosophers. In Numbers 24, verse 17, Balaam prophesied that there shall come a star out of Jacob and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. Now, those astronomers accepted this truth, and they wondered, could this star be the forerunner of the promised Savior? According to Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 60, in a dream their hopes were confirmed when God instructed them to go in search of the newborn prince. Heathens, Heathens. But oh, I, I could see the glow in their eyes at the very thought of prophecy concerning the God of the universe coming to save a troubled world being fulfilled in their lifestyle. Heathens, their lifetime. There's a star in the east, they must have shouted. And according to prophecy, the king of the world is born. Quickly, organize the caravans, prepare the gifts. Load the gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We must go and join the festivities in Jerusalem. Stay with me. Stay with me. They had seen his star, researched his significance, accepted its truth, and with joy in their hearts, they set out to worship and witness. My question to us this morning is, have we seen his star? Have we seen his star? The star that I'm referring to is the light that is Jesus. And I have just shared with you that four things take place in the heart after an encounter with the light. Automatically, you want to know more about the light. For the first thing that you do is you research it. In those studies, you discover the purpose for which the light came into the world and the manner in which he came. You come face to face with Isaiah 53, which gives you in living graphic color the life and times of Jesus in prophecy. Let's assume for a moment, just for a moment, that these astronomers, these heathens, had studied this prophecy. They were unbelievers. And you, you know, it takes a powerful, powerful witness to, to turn an, a, a, a heathen into an unbeliever, uh, to a believer. Is that right? <laughs> Isaiah's prophecy is one of the most powerful that I have ever read. In my study, I discovered the following. Who would have believed the account of humiliation and exaltation of the Messiah, the Lord's servant. Let's assume that they read this. The story of the Savior's selfless love and vicarious sacrifice, the themes of chapter 50 through 213 through 5312. It is the most amazing message, the greatest good tidings of time and eternity. Assume they read that. The graphic picture of the suffering servant is in every sense a prediction that applies to the Messiah. Listen to a few verses. Listen to a few verses. In verse 2, Isaiah 53, he's referred to as a tender plant, a root out of dry ground. Verse 3 refers to him as despised and rejected, a man of sorrows. Verse 4 says,
says that he had borne our grief and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. In verse 7, we find that in all this, he opened not his mouth in protest, complaint, or self-defense. Brother, the sacrifice of Jesus was voluntary. He did it cheerfully in order that all of us might be saved. In verse 10, we find that although not delighted that his servant, the Messiah, should suffer, but because the eternal welfare of mankind was at stake, as well as the security of the universe, it pleased the Lord. Only then could the plan of salvation be fulfilled. The suffering of Christ was part of God's eternal plan. Verse 12. Verse 12 reveals... Listen, stay with me here. This, this is powerful. Verse 12. Now, if they read this, those heathens, this is the verse that I believe would have convicted them. Verse 12 revealed that Christ, the suffering servant, would be victorious. And that God would reward him with a place of high honor in the universe. All that had been lost as a result of sin would be restored. Christ became heir of all things and shares his inheritance with those he rescued from the hand of the enemy. They share in his triumph, not as vassals or slaves, but as men and women redeemed by his blood and destined to reign with him forever. He will receive a name that is above every name, one before which every knee should bow. Can you see their faces? I can imagine their faces. As they read this, I can feel their excitement. They must have asked themselves, can this be his star? Can this be the star of Jacob? What a revelation. It's no wonder they put their lives on hold to follow the star. Say, don't go anywhere. As a result of this powerful revelation, the second thing that one does, number two, is accept him as king of the universe, as those scientists did, and as personal savior, which is to accept his holy scriptures as our guide in life. We will keep his commandment, including the fourth commandment that reminds us to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Also, also, we must accept the fact that our bodies are his temple. These bodies, they belong to God. We have a responsibility, folks, to heed the church's teachings on health reform. I haven't heard that term in a while. If you've heard it lately, raise your hand. Health reform. Two, three, two, three. We have a responsibility. Listen, well, whatever it takes, we should do to preserve these temples of God. Amen. We, we should comply when the church informs us that although meat eating is not a sin, a vegetarian diet is better for your health. Who believes that? Who believes that? Come on, now, who believes that? Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now, now our church, as well as the scientific community, I, I studied this thing. I, I, I researched this thing and I studied it because I had not heard health reform in so long. I said, let me go back and look. Okay? So I looked. So our church and the scientific community also teaches that the smoking tobacco of any kind is unhealthy and leads to pulmonary emphysema and heart disease. As early as 1875, Ellen White wrote, tobacco is a slow, insidious poison and its effects are more difficult to cleanse from the system than those of liquor. Temperance. Page 55. Now, now, I've read that before. And so when I read it again, I said, let me, let me go and see where liquor is in the line of most dangerous drugs today. So I, I went back and I studied. And do you know what I discovered? I read a research paper done by the California Catholic Online. They, were, they did a study, and they released it in the Lancet. And 
in that paper, alcohol was considered the most dangerous drug in the world, among crack cocaine, heroin, and all the other drugs, including prescription. Alcohol is the most dangerous. It is the most dangerous drug in the world, according to the Catholic online, uh, according to their research paper released in the Lancet. And every one of those drugs, crack, cocaine, heroin, alcohol, will kill you. They will kill you. But the thing that hit me the most is that after reading this, I realized that all of them is illegal except the most dangerous one. Which one is that? You can get it at any gas station, any corner store. But the research supported what Mrs. White said in 1875. Cigarette smoking, the effects thereof, is more dangerous and it is, well, it is harder to clean from the system than alcohol. In other words, if, if I, I, I get the idea that if you're trying to cure yourself of the damage done by alcohol, you have a better chance than curing yourself from the damage done by cigarette smoking. I said, wow. I said, wow. Alcohol, the most dangerous drug out there, not only because of its effects to the imbiber, because of its effects on others, the family, the job, uh, deaths by DUI. It's the most dangerous drug there is, but it's harder to clean uh, cigarette smoke from the system. Anyhow, she wrote that. She wrote that, and, and, and I studied it because I wanted to find out where alcohol is, and I discovered that it is the most dangerous drug. Now, <clears throat> The misuse of drugs is condemned in the Bible. The sorcerers of Revelation 28, verse 8, and 22, 15 referred to in the Greek as, as pharmakoi. Pharmakoi is where we get the word pharmacy from. And she said that they are mixers of poison or poisons. Such people in ancient times were often involved in occult practices. She goes on to say that at the coming of Jesus, people who misuse drugs will be classed among murderers and idolaters. Not only the most potent drugs, but those found in coffee and tea are dangerous. Now I'm talking a little bit about evangelism here. Just stay with me. All of the things that I mentioned, the Bible teach. But what the Bible does not teach is that if any of those vices apply to you, if you have any of those problems, you're not already lost. The Bible teaches that there's hope for you. The Bible teaches that as long as there's breath in an individual, there's hope for that individual. The Bible teaches us that we ought not to put one another down because of our vices, but that we ought to pray for one another. We ought to lift one another up. Amen. Because God is able to do anything. Amen. The third development in this list of behavioral changes is that of a worshipful attitude. Like these wise men, immediately after making up one's mind that the light is Jesus, we must pack up our gifts and set out to worship him. Joseph Parker, Joseph Parker, probably the greatest genius in any pulpit in London in the latter part of the 19th century. I studied him in school. He said of this text, and, uh, and I'm quoting him. He said, the magician said, we have come to worship him, to do to literally do homage to him. He continued to say, trust the men who can do homage to anything that is greater than themselves. Always set a high price on reverence. Reverence is the basis of all noble and tender and beneficent character. He said, I would distrust a man or woman who has proven himself destitute of reverence. The fourth attitude is witnessing. This is where we're going next year. Witnessing. We just have to tell somebody. We can't help it. Something happens to men and women when they see the light that is Christ for the first time. Something that we can't really explain. We, we try, but it's, it's hard to explain. 
some psychologists, psychiatrists, philosophers, they have even found ecclesiastical terms to place on this behavior. But it's hard to explain. I'll never forget the latter part of my military experience. And this was back in the 70s. Back in the 70s. Whenever the opportunity arose to witness, I would discuss the Bible with some of my fellow sailors. Word of my actions was revealed to some of the officers in charge. And they assumed that I had stepped off the deep end in the long gun something I never heard before that they call the cookie farm. They call me crazy. Running around telling people that Jesus saves. Telling folks that Jesus can heal the sick. That he can mend broken marriages. That he can get Tony off that alcohol that he's stuck on. You know, I'm running around telling Jesus can help you, Tony. Jason, Jesus can help you to give up cigarettes. I'm running around telling people that and they say, I'm crazy. <laughs> you know, you know, but you know, and uh, I kind of broke the brother's heart a little bit. You know, I'm doing something good here. What, what's going on? You know, and uh, but but one officer came to me, and he said, Dan, he said, I believe you. And I said, Praise God, thank you. And he said, I believe you. He says, I know firsthand that Jesus could do anything. He says, I was on leave on my motorcycle, had an accident, broke every bone in my body. My parents told me I flatlined on the table. They ran to the phone booths. Um, some of you young people don't know what a phone booth is. <laughs> they ran to the phone booth, called the church, remember, and they started praying. The doctors were already writing their report, time, date, reasons. But I coughed. I coughed. I came back, he said. And he said, so I believe you. Amen. There is nothing that God can't do. Amen. So what did I do? I just kept on telling brothers, hey, man, Jesus can help break men your marriage. Amen. Jesus can help you stop drinking. Jesus can help you stop smoking. I just drank on But those officers, they sent me to see a psychiatrist. <laughs> they sent me, you know, he's crazy. He's going around to, okay, so they sent me to see a guy's psychiatrist. The psychiatrist diagnosed me as having had a spiritual awakening. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I like that. I wrote a sermon about it. <laughs> I like that diagnosis because it meant that I had seen the light that is Christ. Amen. And I have discovered that all those who saw the light before me reacted in the same way when they first saw the light. Huh? They researched the light, accepted the light, worshipped the light, and witnessed because of the light, just like those heathen scientists did. Hmm? They, those men, those scientists, had seen the light of God, and it led them to research the mystery behind the light. They accepted the call as a result of a dream that they had, and they rushed right out to find and worship the king of the world. Amen. Huh? Heathens, unbelievers. Not only were they believers now, but they accepted the call to witness. The record shows, listen to this, listen to this, listen carefully. The record shows that they were some of the first evangelists to alert Jerusalem that the king of the world had been born. Hmm? Remember that text? Matthew chapter 2, verse 2. Their very words was a testimonial to their conversion. Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. It wasn't the first time, nor would it be the last time that the light of Jesus would shine in the hearts of men. Ruth the Moabite saw the light while married to Malon, the son of Elimelech and Naomi, through their lifestyles, their morning and evening worship, their modest dress and health conscious diet, their keeping of God's commandment, including the fourth, 
says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. In their lifestyles, Ruth saw the light of God and accepted. She noticed their response to hard times and disaster. When there was no food on the table, praise God was their response. Somebody say amen. amen. When there was no roof over their heads, praise God. When they only husband died, praise God. When the first son died, praise God. When the second son died, praise God. Ruth must have said, wait a minute. Who is this God that you serve in the good times and the bad? I want to know him. The record is dead. You're ready. The record is dead. In Ruth chapter 1, Naomi's husband and both her sons died. She said to her daughters-in-law, go back to your own homes and God be with you both. One of them did as she was instructed. But verse 14 tells us that Ruth clung to her mother-in-law. And verse 16 and 17, we read where Ruth, convicted by the lifestyle of God, commandment keeping people, God's commandment keeping people, uttered one of the most powerful testimonies for acceptance of God ever recorded on behalf of a new believer. Hmm? She said to Naomi, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. Yes. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Amen. Where thou diest, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, and Lord, but death part thee in me. Praise God for the light and the lifestyle. Amen. Live the life, brother. Yes. And by the grace of God, somebody yes. will be saved. Amen. There were others. There were others. Moses saw the light in a bush that burned yet was not consumed. Saul saw the light on the road to Damascus and went on to write most of the material and the new History is loaded with those who have seen the light and been convicted by it. But let, let me get back. Let me get back to the matter. Because they encountered some disappointments that you and I ought to be aware of. They were en route to Jerusalem to join the festivities they assumed were going on as a result of the Savior's birth. Their sighting of the star was purely by accident. They were not looking for the coming of the Savior. As stated before, they were heathens. But surely the Seventh-day Adventists, uh, uh, no, surely the Jews who were supposed to be looking for it had seen it and was rejoicing and praising God. No doubt they must have thought dignitaries from around the world would be there with offerings and gifts welcome the newborn king. So as by faith, Abraham went forth at the call of God, not knowing whether he went, and as by faith, Israel followed the pillow of cloud to the promised land, these Gentiles set out to find the promised city. Now, arriving in Israel, nearing Jerusalem, the star that they had seen disappeared. It rested over the temple, and then it just faded from sight. Rushing on into Jerusalem, they expected the joyful news to be on every tongue. Everybody would be talking about it. But business was as usual. There were no festivities. And it seemed that no one knew anything about the new king. Their questions were met with fear and contempt. The wise men were crushed. Disappointment was all they encountered during their stay in Jerusalem. Even the star had faded from sight. They turned Jerusalem upside down looking for somebody to tell them about Jesus. They evangelized the whole city, going up and down asking, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we've seen his star and we've come to worship him. Over and over they alerted the citizens of that capital city that its savior had been born. However, they couldn't find anyone to share in their excitement. No, not even in Jerusalem. 
They were disappointed, but they were not beaten. They were driven by a dream that they had, no lack of interest, wicked devising, or lies would turn them away from their appointed course. They left Jerusalem just as the shadows of night was about to fall, determined to find a new king. Since arriving in Jerusalem, they had not seen the star, but all the darkness fell and the star shone again. The joy that had been theirs from the beginning of their journey returned. Brother, I want to tell you that after you've seen the light, accepted and began your journey, you'll find that sometimes the road is going to be rough. It's going to be hard. There will be some disappointments. And sometimes you're going to feel that you can't go on. But when you get to that point, please look up. Because it is then that you're at a very dark point in your experience. And only then can you see that the star that is Jesus is still shining. Amen. Amen. The wise men with joy in their heart forged on to Bethlehem. There they found the Savior, worshipped him, and laid their gifts before him. I'm sure that their lives were never the same after that. Just as I'm sure that yours will never be the same after today if you have seen the light that is Jesus as you have never seen him before. Hmm? Some of you may be seeing the light for the first time. Diana, sweetheart. You're not a member of God's Sabbath-keeping church, but your vision of Christ today through his word has convinced you that this is the way and that you ought to walk in. If that is the case, I want you to come down front as we sing this song. Words go like this. It's a, I think it's the thing to refrain. Are you ready for Jesus to come? Are you ready for Jesus to come? Are you faithful in all that you do? Stand with me, please. Are you faithful in all that you do? Have you fought the good fight? Have you stood for the right? Are you ready for Jesus to come? If you have seen the light today as never before, and you're not a member of God's Sabbath-keeping church, I'm asking for you to come down this morning. I'm asking for you to make Jesus your choice this morning. I'm asking you this morning to accept the light. Are you here? Please, won't you come if you're here? If you're here, won't you come? Make Jesus your choice today. Sing that song. We're going to sing that. Are you faithful in all that you do?
and eternal God, precious Savior, we just want to be ready when you come. We thank you for the word today, Lord. We thank you for the wisdom therein. We thank you for the light that is Jesus. Now, Father, as we depart this place, we pray that you will not depart us, but that your presence will stay with us throughout the end of this year and the beginning of next year. Bless us to this.